I have great news, everyone. Our powerful Plan Strong Kitchen assistant has just undergone one huge makeover to be even more powerful in helping you save time and money as you plan and prepare plant-based meals throughout the week. We still have hundreds of whole food, plant-based, oil-free recipes personalized to your preferences. We have adaptive grocery lists and grocery delivery via Instacart or Amazon. But now, in addition, we also offer exclusive content and discounts on partner brands like Vitamix, for example, plus live support from my team of friendly experts. You can try it for free for two weeks when you use the code START fresh, all one word, on our annual plan. And yeah, you got to enter our credit card to redeem it, but you can cancel with one click if it doesn't absolutely knock your socks off. Visit PlanStrong.com to check out our new and improved PlanStrong meal planner. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plan Strong Podcast. The mission at Plan Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. My Plan Strong cousins, in a world that is littered with false information and blatant lies, especially when it comes to health and nutrition, it is vitally important to seek the truth. My guest today, Matthew Reese is a treasure trove of facts and commentary about food and health. In fact, that's exactly the name of his website, foodandhealthfacts.com. As a longtime journalist, speech writer, and author, Reese is a truth seeker by nature. He has written for such esteemed publications like The Economist, The New Republic, and The Wall Street Journal. His writing also has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, and the Reader's Digest, to name a few. He's also co-authored several books, but his personal passion lies in nutrition, and that's how we've come to know each other. It's also why I wanted to have him on the Plant Strong podcast. So when his travels brought him through Austin, Texas, I embraced the chance to meet up with Matthew in person and discuss the facts. And that's exactly what we do today. I would encourage you to bookmark his website, foodandhealthfacts.com. And if you're able, follow along with us during the interview, where we talk through several of the blog entries on his website. Matthew pulls information and research from recent scientific studies, interviews, books, and much more. And he makes them all easily digestible nuggets of truth on our toxic food culture and how it's contributing to the massive rates of disease and death throughout our country. It is his mission to help us understand how consuming unhealthy foods leads to the mess of chronic Western issues that we're facing today as a society, but also provide understanding and solutions. So let's dig into the facts with Matthew Reese. All right, Matthew Reese, welcome to Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rip. It's great to be here. Great to have you here. Great to have you on the Plant Strong podcast. Let's just review for a second when we when we first met and then kind of how that kind of has evolved to you being here today. Um, if I remember correctly, we first met because you called me to ask me some questions about Eddie Reese. Were you doing a book about Eddie? I was writing a profile of him for Swim Swam. And yeah, we, you and I uh, talked and you provided a lot of very useful information. And then kind of at the end of the interview, I I asked you about the the plant-based side of your life. That's right. And for the listener that's not aware, uh, Eddie Reese is the coach of the Texas Longhorns. I think they've won 15 or 16 national championships the most successful NCAA Division I coach 
ever on the planet. Um, I had the privilege of swimming for him back in 1982 to 1986, and he's just an absolute legend. Um, and so we talked about kind of what I was doing and getting into you know plant-based nutrition. And then, if I'm not mistaken, you came to one or a couple of the, our plant stock events. I did. I came. You you told me about it, and that I think it was the 2016 plant stock up at the Esselstyn family farm, which was a very inspiring event. And then about six months later, I brought my sister and my parents to a um, to one of your events in I think it was in Burbank uh, or Hollywood, California, and. Yeah equally inspiring and prompted my sister to go home that night and literally clean out her refrigerator. So you had a big impact on, on her and she has done her best to try to maintain that uh, sort of the, the plant strong lifestyle. What then inspired you to uh, get interested in an even deeper level in issues around food and health? So I had been someone who I never really paid very close attention to my diet and, mm-hmm. and just ate in hopes of not being hungry, just to, as a you know, fuel and kind of satiation. And I have a friend, a, a physician in McLean, Virginia, near where I live, who is a plant-based doctor. And she kind of in, helped introduce me to a lot of the, the thinking and your father and Colin Campbell and others. And so I Having gone plant-based, I then started reading more and more. But it was really um, during during COVID that I, like a lot of people, I had a little more time and I saw what was happening and to people who had a lot of uh, uh, chronic disease and obesity and how they were experiencing much higher rates of hospitalization and, and mortality uh, when they contracted COVID. And I just thought, this is, if I'm ever going to kind of carve out some time to uh, to write about these issues, this is this is probably it. So in October of 2020, I launched a newsletter, uh, food and health, a website, foodandhealthfacts.com, and then a newsletter that that was uh, part of the that website. Right. And so for those that are not watching on YouTube that are just listening to this, um, we we have it actually up on the screen, your website, Food and Health Facts, uh, right here. Um, and your first, your first ever number one, you know, health fact, uh, was called a big fat crisis. And, um, can you remember exactly kind of the stats that you had in that one? Well, I think it was the, it was, I think it was between about 1975 and maybe 2016 and that the, the obesity rate in the United States had increased, uh, at a greater kind of maybe percentage than really any other country in the world. And that, to me, um, there's so many dimensions of this issue that that I'm fascinated by and, frankly, a little depressed by. But the, the U.S., the United States being really an outlier globally when it comes to obesity. And today, for all intents and purposes, having the highest obesity rate in the world, 42.4% of American adults. And how is it that this country with such high living standards and supposedly this first class healthcare system is has really the worst um, sort of kind of dietary habits and, and the worst outcomes when it comes to health and so much of it driven by food. And you look at that in a lot of your, um, your facts and you've got 189 of them right now that you've done over the last two plus years. And I, uh, I subscribe to your newsletter. I find each one to be just really fascinating. And, you know, you've, you've expanded lately, and they're a little bit longer. The first ones were just kind of, you know, morsel sizes. Yes. And, and now they've gotten, gotten bigger, and you're, and you're writing a little bit more. So what I'd love to do with you right now is I'd like to start in reverse order. So instead of starting at number one, mm-hmm. I'm going to start at 189, and then we're going to, just going to pick somewhere between 25 and 35 Great. And, just, and just talk about them. Great. And I went through and I counted up, of the 189 that you have, somewhere close to 50 of them have the word obesity oh. in, in the title. And I think that that's a kind of something that's very present in these facts is just the 
level of obesity that we've reached and the different um, kind of side effects that are happening in this country because of that. And I think the, the whole thing that started you off on this journey was, you know, when you have several different comor- comorbidities, including obesity, what it does to your chances of, of being hospitalized or death when you contract uh, COVID. Yes, yes. So um, for those of you that are not watching this, um, we'll do our best to explain what's going on. But I'm right now, I'm just scrolling down, and we're starting at fact number 189. Mm-hmm. And this just came out uh, 316, 2023. Okay. Why we overeat and why it's hard to lose weight. And I have a couple notes right here. Um, and this is kind of a, you took an interview that Ezra Klein was having yeah. with, help me with his name, Stefan. I think it's Guinette. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Guinette. Yeah. yeah. Um, who's a neurobiologist and the author of The Hungry Brain. Um, but can you speak to this? This aspect called sensory specific satiety. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating concept, and and I think the the simplest way to explain it is that um, that the more different foods you have on the plate, the more likely the more you're actually likely to eat, and that somehow that you know having six potatoes, for example, you might get full at three, but if you have I don't know, th- you know, three other maybe big vegetables, you're going to somehow your brain senses, oh, that's different. And so you almost get it was almost like a, a refresh and and that that's that that satiety that you thought you had actually isn't there. And it's he explains why how that's one of the problems with eating at a, a buffet is that you have all these different foods and you just you fill your plate and and the result is you obviously you overeat and many of the foods at buffets obviously are often not particularly good for you exactly and 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 to me there's something about when you eat something that's savory and then you can get completely full on savory but now it's like that sweet part of your stomach or your brain right wants something that is sweet and like for example i just went to the uh, expo west trade show kind of similar to a trade show that you went to recently millions of square feet i don't know how many different booths probably ten thousand different food booths everybody's handing out samples by you know we started walking the floor at nine by 9 45 i'm full right just from sampling all these bars and plant-based things um but at some point i'm like wow you know what i could use something that's savory even though i've already sampled 30 different plant-based bars right so it, 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 i know exactly this sensory specific satiety you're talking about another thing that they talk about there and you talk about it in several of your fun facts is snacking occasions and how those have just kind of ramped up significantly over the last like 20 30 years yeah yeah and that's the that's what there you you'll see a lot of different ideas about kind of what is driving obesity and but one of the one of the theories that's been put forward is that just people are eating more throughout the day and it's not just you know three meals it's it's it might be breakfast lunch and dinner but then almost kind of half meals at you know in between each of these different meals and and we just see that the kind of the broader issue is that is sort of the the ubiquity of food. You know, you go to the hardware store and they're selling candy bars at the checkout stand. And you just and the I think also, you know, frankly, the 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 fact that so much food now, particularly after during COVID and after it's so much easier for food to get delivered to the home. And so it's and so you're just you're sort of you cannot it's often it can be difficult unless you're making a conscious effort to sort of pull back and escape from having all of these the the kind of the influence of this food and this is typically these these this food that's all around us it's typically not fruits and vegetables it's you know it's highly processed food that can sit around on the shelf somewhere for weeks or months and and so that just it sort of plays into all of the temptations and and we see what the result has been exactly right it's 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 ultra processed little to no water no fiber loaded with oil salt sugar everything that our brains just crave uh and and you're right i can't remember how many calories on average people are snacking on per day but i'm sure it's somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 300 to 600 easily 
yeah. e- easily. Yeah, and just a deliver- just today, I was reading about how all of these processed food companies are creating all of these little new snacks to again just their their sort of twist. It's you know sort of new some new form of Doritos, and they're just always coming up with these new product lines, and it's just to try to sort of you know they 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 feel people may be. It's, it's new and novel, so it's going to get people to buy it. And there's actually data on how the processed food companies, they, the number of products they are unveiling every single year to play on this sort of the, you know, check this out, new, you better try it. And, you know, they win and the human body loses. Yeah, yeah. Another, another little point that they talked about in this interview, Ezra Klein with Stephen, uh, was even doing something as simple as just changing the shape of the food can actually change how much you eat. Yes, the sh- the shape of the food, and there's also, I mean, this this gets into a very interesting issue, which is uh, called food choice architecture. And you, there have been some some university dining halls that, and Stanford is one of them, and um, where they they don't have trays anymore because you know you go into a dining yes. hall and it's this big huge tray and it feels odd to just maybe have one little plate and or one plate and so they got rid of trays and they also make the the, the plates smaller because again it feels odd if you have this big plate and you just you just have just a tiny little bit of, bit of food on the plate and so and it's something that that plays in that you know every person in every kitchen can can do this is to not necessarily have you know, food out and visible, or, or if you're going to have the food that's out, have it be the, you know, the bananas and the apples and the carrots, not the junk. And, but yeah, and, but the shape of the food, again, plays into this. And it's just sort of the, the, the tricks that, that, well, the food companies are trying to play on you, but the tricks that your brain are playing on you. And it, and the reminder sort of the broad point is that how much you really have to be conscious of the food environment, if you're going to resist all of these temptations. Yeah. Well, you brought up Stanford there, and you have a, a whole uh, fact uh, on Stanford, I believe. And one of the things they did as well is they try, as far as that choice architecture is concerned, they try and put, I believe it's some of the healthiest food in the beginning, like the salads and the soups. Yeah. Uh, and then also just how they labeled the food. Yes. So instead of labeling it carrots, yeah. it was like Twisted roasted carrots, yeah. and people would eat like twenty percent more or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it was just it was an interesting little study where they, yeah, they did in the dining hall over a period of about a month. They would give these kind of creative labels to what were just everyday carrots, <laughs> yes. and they did it, somehow they were able to kind of monitor that consumption did go up, and it just you know it 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 what it underscores is look you know marketing matters, and that's people want to think that something maybe has some extra flair or some extra degree of nutrition nutrition typically this marketing obviously is done in service of ultra processed food and there's all this what what we have talked about you know what you've written about and I have health washing um, and it's you know it's easy for the processed foods to do health washing it's very hard frankly for a carrot or an apple or banana uh, yeah. or any fruits or vegetables because that's just they are what they are, and you can't and 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 where and you can't necessarily hype too much, um, or it's difficult for the consumer to believe uh, that hype. But in this case, in the Stanford example, that it, it, at least with a group of college students, it seemed to have some effect. So you mentioned health washing. The the next fact one one eighty eight is don't believe the health hype, right here, and. Um, if I'm not, I, I love this where you start out by saying, you know, way back, what, 40 years ago, Fruit Loops was spelled F R O O T. Yeah. Because there's no fruit in it, they couldn't legally put fruit, right? That was my, that was my introduction to the world of kind of, of deceptive marketing. I still, again, it was in a documentary in my fourth grade class and, and it, 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 I'd always, I've remembered it to this day. Yeah. Yeah. But you wrote this whole piece that you've written here is all about, health washing, as you see right here. And uh, you mentioned how Michael Pollan has cleverly captured how health washing works and how it tricks consumers. Um, And I think that unless, if you don't, I think, so one of, I learned from a very, very brilliant uh, dietitian, Jeff Novick, who Mm -hmm. maybe you saw at uh, at Plant Stock back then. But he said the first rule in reading a, uh, a label 
uh, is never, ever, ever, ever believe the front of anything on any package or box yeah. or, um, or can, yeah. right? So that's number one. Yeah. Because that's all they're trying to do is do that old health washing there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's um, without a doubt. Yeah, I, I think, and maybe I've heard him say, don't buy any food that's making a health claim. For that exact reason, because you're, it's, it's probably not. They're, they're going to come yeah. up with some, you know, rich in vitamins, and they don't, you know, they're not mentioning. Well, it's also high in sugar, and it doesn't have any fiber. They don't tell you all the bad stuff, obviously. And, and the, the related point is just understanding how to read a nutrition label, and you don't have to. They, it's not all. It's not as simple as maybe we would like it to be, and it doesn't contain all the information that we, I think, some of us think should be there. But you can find, you know, be aware of what does it say about added sugars and what is the level of sodium and, yes. and what is the level of fiber. And just there are a few kind of basic things that can be a signal to you as to whether this is something you really want to be consuming. No, you're exactly right. I think if you can focus on some of those macro things like, okay, let's look at add, added sugars, let's look at fiber, because if there's a lot of fiber, that probably means it's a more of a whole food. Let's, it's also a whole grain. Let's look at sodium, as you said there, and then let's also look at fats and oils. Those are the kind of some of the biggies. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see here. Number one eighty-seven, and 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 for those that are watching, just know that I'm not going to go from one eighty-nine all the way down to one, right? But we're going to start out pretty strong here. So the the ominous obesity out, uh, outlook emanating from America's schools. What can you tell me about this? Because it's it's pretty darn sad. Yeah, I mean, this in many ways is the um, in a situation or environment that has a lot of very depressing facts. The 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 high obesity rate among America's children, which is by some measures the highest obesity rate, the high, the highest childhood obesity rate anywhere in the world, and you have. Um, yeah, you, look, you have the the environment and the home is contributing to this. I mean, in, in some ways, the, the st some studies show that actually the healthiest food that kids are getting is actually in the school, which is kind of a remarkable fact. And it's not that the food is great. It's just that the food they're getting so, so uh, in other environments is so much worse. 67% of the calories that children, American children consume today comes from ultra-processed foods, which is just a recipe for long-term mm -hmm. you know disease and disability and 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 being overweight and all sorts of chronic conditions and um and the data several studies came out during covid showing that the it was already a big problem but it actually became worse during covid as children obviously weren't in school and were stuck at home and we'd see obviously high rates of depression and other factors and um, I think the, the, the food became probably a source of some degree of comfort, and they defaulted to, again, largely unhealthy, highly processed, ultra-processed foods. Mm -hmm. did, you, um, did you interview Marion Nestle at all? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that she remarked about this is, you know, why isn't everyone behind healthier food for kids? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's like, yeah, re right. really? how can you and you I mean, right now, there's an effort at the, you know, the Food and Drug Administration to to uh, make some modifications to school lunches and the processed food companies are coming out and throwing up all sorts of objections to it. And and then you have the, you know, the federal, the kind of what used to be known as the food stamp program, the supplemental nutrition, supplemental nutrition assistance program, which. Unfortunately, it look it serves an important purpose for certain segments, low income segments, but there are no restrictions on the on the foods and the beverages that can be purchased and the the data shows federal data shows that very high rates of of purchase of basically junk foods and beef jerky and sugar sweetened beverages and the children are paying the price and it's and and it's going to have extraordinarily uh uh, harmful long-term consequences for them and, frankly, for the whole country. Yeah. Well, you mentioned SNAP. Uh, I think you wrote one of your your facts was about how when people get their, their I guess, these food stamps, yeah. right, The these grocery stores know exactly when they get them, and that's when they put the kind of the uh, sugar, sugar, sugary beverages yeah. 
the big ads or even the you know the promos and stuff like that. But the timing is yeah. In- no, that was a that was an extraordinary study showing that yes that that the I think it was maybe the Center for Science and Public Interest actually went into these stores and monitor and because there are there's a certain time each month when the benefits. Um, become available to the to the recipients and that and that they just tracked yeah the the kind of the presence of these i don't know these sort of the, you see these big stacks of sugar sweetened beverages the sodas and the rest in the stores and there were more of them and um and so this and this is sort of the the story of of snap also is that the you know the big winners are the food and beverage companies and the and the stores that that sell these products and the losers are the, or the you know the the beneficiaries of the people who are getting the snap dollars and there's been an effort to try to um, to to change this and, and this was made, and I'm getting a little bit off the topic here but one yeah. of the more perverse I live in Washington D.C. and I feel like I've seen a lot but one of the most more perverse sort of examples of kind of how lobbying works is that the the food and beverage companies contribute large sums of money to the anti hunger groups and the anti hunger groups then advocate against any restrictions on how SNAP dollars can be sent. And so in the name of it's kind of equity, and I, I understand the sensitivities, but again, it's the food and beverage companies who are winning literally billions of dollars. I mean, SNAP accounts for massive, massive sales for food and beverage companies and for the retailers. So they win in a big way, and it's just sort of the cycle just goes on and on, and you have the beneficiaries having higher rates of obesity and disability and disease. Yeah. In this, in this, um, I think it's this same, in the same vein, mm-hmm. you talk about how, and this is going back to the kids yeah. and the obesity there, how, uh, you know, we uh, now have one in five kids that are obese compared to one in 20 in the 1960s. Yeah. But you talk about how when there was in, I can't remember what state it was, it was some state, they were trying to ban sodas. Yeah. And you said that six Coca-Cola execs were immediately on a f- plane to fly to that state to kill the bill. Yeah, I mean, you, how, it's like how can you win when right. when right. you when you're dealing with that kind of I guess what power? Yeah, yeah. No, they look. There are extraordinarily um, kind of vested interests, and and again, this sort of gets into why at the federal level, why you really here you have this national crisis. Again, forty-two percent of American adults obese, and you, for all intents and purposes, you purposes you have the federal government not doing anything at all. And there's a there's a there's a bigger story about that which we can get into if you want. But a lot of it does come down to the fact that the food and beverage companies are big donors to members of Congress, and so there there's really the Congress has really just taken a hands-off approach to uh, to mm-hmm. any of these issues, which is just again <clears throat> striking when you think that. That the foods we eat and the beverages we cons- we we consume are the single biggest driver of mortality in this country, and we're just we're not doing anything about it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Would you say that it is the white elephant in the room, or? or yeah, I mean, I feel. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I mean, I sometimes think about this in the context of you know smoking and. In 1964, the adult U.S. adult smoking rate was 42 percent, and a decision was made. You know what? This is not. Millions of people are suffering disease, and we have high rates of death, and and there was a, just a decision that we're going to try to do something about this, and you know, and it worked. <laughs> like the, the smoking rate is still too high; it's still about 14 <clears> percent, <throat> but it was one of the greatest public health victories, definitely in the second half of the 20th century, other than uh, in addition to the controlling HIV AIDS. But there's been no similar effort with regard Mm -hmm. to health and food, uh, with regard to kind of the intersection of food and health. And, um, you know, and the result is the United States has the lowest life expectancy of just about any developed country in the world. And the bill really came due due during COVID when the U.S. much higher... Yeah. mortality rate, U.S. life expectancy fell three years. It's now at a level that it hasn't been since 1996. And so much of this has to do with the food we eat. And it's still, and it's still, I'm still struck that it, that part of the debate, there were other issues why the U.S. had, had struggled with COVID, but the, it's kind of the food dimension and the 
uh, all of the comorbidities were largely, I feel, overlooked as uh, or have been overlooked or not received the attention they deserve over the past three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super, super disappointing. I mean, what a, what an opportunity yeah. for us to potentially, you know, right the ship, yeah. steer it in the right direction. And, um, and it, it feels like we missed out. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, it, and that was, I was sort of hopeful and I knew it was, it, you know, it was an uphill battle, but I was hopeful that maybe during COVID there would be kind of this awakening. Yeah. And I just don't, I think it just sort of got overtaken by other events and, and other concerns. And, um, so I, I, I try to be optimistic and not my, some of my, my friends and people who read the newsletter, Sometimes refer to me as Doctor Doom, but, <laughs> but but you know I don't. This is uh, sugarcoating. Maybe isn't the right word to use, but I don't. You know, it's I don't feel like there's no upside in sort of trying to present a better picture than there is because there are so many uh, really adverse indicators that again, even before COVID, U.S. life expectancy was declining, which is just a striking, <laughs> striking. I mean that that if, and it happened for about three years in a row. It hadn't happened since the Spanish flu in 1918. <laughs> And so in so many ways, this just in terms of the health indicators of this country, we're going in absolutely the wrong direction. And and so much of it is really traced back to the food we eat. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> it seems pretty darn obvious. Yeah. Right. I mean, everywhere we turn, there's more food, more alt highly ultra processed food that is staring us in the face. Like you said, whether it's a hardware store, whether it's whatever, yeah. you're going to be faced with it. And you've got to be able to say, no, thank you. And then everywhere we turn, it seems like our lifestyles are getting much more sedentary as well. So I think you combine, you combine those two, two things together, and it, and it's, uh, it doesn't bode well for us. Uh, so I think people need to, they need to take, take the reins. Yeah in a major major way yeah let's let's talk about obesity for a second yeah and uh you have a fact number 185 the weight loss drugs are not without risks and the big weight loss drug right now is uh what's how do you pronounce it well it's the you know wagovi or ozempic okay. or semaglutide and and there's i think different brands and but but those are those are broadly the ones that are getting all the attention and were even referenced at the you know the academy awards recently yeah so what's your opinion of them well you know i'm i i sort of have mixed views i mean i think that they I, my understanding of sort of how they function is they basically function as an appetite suppressant and and so um, and there, you know, there's on the one hand, it, the data shows there's, they're so fairly effective. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing. Um, but th there are, you know, there, there are significant side effects and it's a weekly injection and it's not, it's not a cure as long as you have to, in order to, to benefit from these drugs, you have to keep taking them. So you're really talking about a lifetime uh, commitment and and that's I you know I just I I have some concerns are we this is, we're a highly highly medicated society to begin with and reflecting the, the poor state of our uh, metabolic health and this is just another drug and so um, so I so I'm not I haven't quite exactly figured out precise you know I just uh, there's there are pros and cons and but I would you know, the, look, the ideal arrangement, and my concern is that that people are just, that this is a signal, you can just eat whatever you want and just take a drug. And that's not, uh, I don't think that's the long-term solution. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but if it can help reduce the, you know, the diabetes rate and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and some of these, some of these chronic conditions, you know, that's a good thing. But I don't, I don't think we should look at it as a panacea. I couldn't couldn't agree with you more there. Um, <clears throat> you recently went to a, a huge trade show, and yeah. you said it was all about these really innovative uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, and I think let me just see here. That's yeah, number here it is. The entrepreneurs striving to improve oh, yeah. human health. Let's just let's just talk about one. 
And that was this person that has invented, invented this electric spoon. Yeah. And who is it and what does this electric spoon do? Yeah, so um, he's just a... He's just an inventor, and and he's he's invented this spoon that has a um, sort of a magnetic electromagnetic force. And the idea behind it, I didn't exp- I didn't actually use it, so I can't really vouch for it. But is that it it magnifies the the sensa- the taste of you know salt or sugar. And so the idea is that by using the spoon, you can actually use less salt and less sugar on your foods. And so it's one of these little, you know, is it a, is it a, you know, a, the ticket to better health mm-hmm. in and of itself? Probably not, but it's kind of a clever idea. And, you know, the more the merrier. I mean, this is assuming these things are, there's some degree of effectiveness that these are, you know, these are the sorts of innovations that we need because, you know, the food and beverage companies, they're innovating like crazy to get us to yeah. eat worse and if we it'd be nice to have yeah. some countervailing forces like these little like this little spoon well and that's a really good point because these huge food companies are trying to create that ultimate bliss point point. Yeah. and it, so it sounds like this spoon for example is a way to counteract so you can eat healthier foods that don't have these crazy amounts of salt and sugar and fat and it raises all those things so you maybe are creating that bliss point without all the bad that's associated with it yeah yeah no and i think that's right I, the, the 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 sort of the one other point as you know is that that um with a lot of these these foods uh the issue is not really the the salt you're adding it's the salt that's already that they come with kind of preloaded with so much sodium so you really have to be yeah. aware of that, and but if you're eating, say, sodium-free foods, maybe yeah. you can yeah. use less salt as a result yeah. of the spoon. For those of you that want to eat the plant-strong chilies and stews yeah. with the electric spoon, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic choice. Uh, number one eighty-one, you say eat like an Italian. Yeah. So what's going on in Italy that we should try and, uh, you know, uh, absorb here in the States? Yeah, this was a fascinating um, kind of topic to explore. And, you know, the Italians among the world's um, developed economies really have a do have a lower obesity rate. So obesity really is a it's a kind of a global epidemic, but it is the rates tend to be higher in wealthier countries, Italy being an outlier and. They have a rich culinary tradition. They cook a lot, and as we know, I mean, if the, the you, look, you can cook unhealthy food, but but you're, there's a much greater likelihood of of if if you're cooking for yourself, you're going to be avoiding obviously all of the ultra processed foods. So they cook for themselves, and again, and they just have a much lower level of consumption of ultra processed foods. And they just have an appreciation for kind of the value of food. And, and there's also some evidence that the, the portion sizes are, are smaller. And, um, you know, and the results, the, the data, again, shows lower obesity rates and, and higher, um, longer life expectancy. And so it's a, it's the, um, they, in many ways, they should be a model for the United States and for other countries who are s- struggling with an obesity epidemic. Yeah. Another one of your, your facts you have is how much time some of these, on average, these countries spend at mealtime. And if I'm not mistaken, the Amer- Americans on average spend 61 minutes at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, the 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 study showed that it I, it ranked I don't know twenty five or thirty countries, and maybe they were all advanced countries. But I think Italy, maybe in France, spent the most time. They eating. were like one hundred and thirty minutes. Yeah. and yeah. the U.S. last, you know, or the you know basically the least amount of time eating. And so, um, well, which, which is funny because. I guess, and I think that the fun fact was something like the less amount of time spent eating correlates with greater obesity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, and you, you I mean, you could see that the other way, meaning, oh, well, if you're eating a lot, it's going to take you longer. But, but um, I think that that, and one point related to this is that there's some evidence that you know, that ultra processed food, it just sort of, it just goes down quicker. And and part of the problem with with again with the ultra processed food is 
it provides lower level of satia satiation. So you eat more and you don't feel full. And so, um, but Americans and sort of the convenience culture and fast food and the rest, which we're all familiar with, it's just sort of grab and go and eat on the run. And so you're not thinking about what you're eating. And I think that's one, as you know, better than I do, but that's kind of one of the real pillars of, of healthier eating is reflecting on what it is that you're consuming and spending some time with it and ideally doing it with uh, eating with other people. Yeah. Yeah. No, that socialization, sitting around the table, yeah. taking your time. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about, because uh, you, you mentioned satiation there, and one of your, your, your facts is what foods are the most satiating. Oh, yeah. And we'll get to that in, in a second here. Um, but before we do, let's talk about... Um, Let's go to let's go to 149. We're gonna jump jump down here to one of your older posts here. And um, let's see. Is it? Uh, we've got to keep going. Here we go. So why so little advocacy yeah. about dietary health? And um, you know, I think that you make the the correlation here with with climate change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it's really powerful. Yeah, this was something that um, it just struck me. So you think about how much advocacy there is about climate change, and, and I'm not challenging any of that, but but you think about just how much there is relative to how much advocacy there is and kind of multinational efforts, international efforts around diet and health. And uh, again, the with diet and health being the single biggest driver of, of mortality, not just in the United States, but globally. And, you know, it just sort of begs the question, like, why isn't why isn't there more happening? And and uh, there's kind of complex reasons for this. And, and there's a whole uh, sort of infrastructure that has been built up around climate change. And that's that's fine. But but if you know, if you think about if someone had whether it's a million dollars or five million or a hundred million, you know, where would it be better to put that money? And I would like to think that, you know, the, the I almost feel like diet and health, it's almost sort of like an emerging market. You know, it's just not getting the attention. And there's a huge potential upside yeah. for what can be done. And whereas there's a lot of money going into into climate advocacy. And again, I'm not questioning that, but um, but food and health just does not get the attention I think that it deserves given, you know, people are dying <laughs> right now, every day, and, and millions of people uh, a year are dying of consequences related to their diet. And um, you would just think that there would be more concerted advocacy around that. Well, and you talk about how, I mean, we almost know that the number one driver globally uh, of death is eating the wrong foods. Yeah. And I think you said it was somewhere, it's like 17 million, something like that. Whereas how many people have died from, let's just say, climate change, right? It's, it's significantly less than that. Yeah. And the, to me, the crazy thing is that if we could get the preponderance of people to eat this way, not only could we, you know, basically solve this, you know, our four trillion dollar annually yeah. healthcare bill, we could also, I think, in the most powerful way, make a dent on climate change. Yes, yes, it's well, the, the silver bullet for that. No, that's exactly, and that's the part that, and that's the. I'm glad you raised that because I mean, and that's the part that so often doesn't even come up uh -uh. in these in these climate discussions, these international climate discussions, or domestic is, is is the uh, consumption of, of meats in particular. And in fact, um, I, I think one of the sponsors of the most recent climate summit was, I don't know if it was McDonald's or Coca-Cola. And, you know, it was just sort of like, we're just completely missing the, the connection between the two. And, and it, it just sort of underscores all of the ways in which this whole issue is, um, you know, all of the indicators are wrong and all of the forces are wrong and, and you know, we're paying a massive, massive price. And I, I you know, I sort of wonder in 25, 50, 75 years, are, are people going to look back on this era and say, you know, what were they doing? I mean, sort of the way we would look back at, you know, the advertisements for doctors, you know, smoking. Sure. And, um, 
and I just and I so I you know I don't know I'm I'm I don't I'm not going to be here in 75 years, but I but I uh, would like to think that there's going at some point there's going to be some recognition that the whole yeah. the food system in the it really in the U.S. but really globally. Uh, the way in which it is, uh, it's it's harming the recipients. And look, starvation and hunger is not cured, but the problem is not that's not the that's not the primary problem now. Mm-hmm. The problem mm-hmm. is it's too much food, not too little. And we some we and we solved largely solved uh, that that hunger problem, but then we we went overboard in the other direction, and we're paying a mm-hmm. huge price. Well, one of the most well known climate uh, advocates is Greta. Thornburg, is that her last name, if I'm not mistaken? And I just read a little piece that said that in her whole book, in this new book she just wrote, she has, I think, one page on on eating. And um, I think it's, it's unfortunate that even somebody like her, who probably is not, just has not made the connection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 uh, No, it's striking that. And no one, I mean, look, she's 18, but you'd think someone would have said to her, would have read the book, and well, very is, much you're, so. you're, you're missing something here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to... Um, so you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, and so let's, let's come back to this. Washington is yeah. missing in action yeah. on, on obesity. Why? Yeah, so I think... So it, it, I think it starts with uh, just the campaign contributions of the food and beverage companies, and they're, they give to both parties, and they give a lot, and so that helps sort of stifle, I think, any any reform. And um, but then I think you you have you have forces on both in with both parties, with Republicans and Democrats, and so. With the Republicans, you have a just sort of a built-in resistance to any form of regulation or taxation, and they, we saw this when you know Michael Bloomberg tried to do some of the some some of his reforms, and even what Michelle Obama did, and there was just a, we don't, and the the phrase that always gets tossed around is you know nanny state or big brother, and so that sort of for Republicans that often is kind of a deal breaker. Um, among the Democrats, you have a um, basically people who are overweight or obese, I think have become, it's sort of almost evolved into a form of identity politics and they don't want to be accused of being, doing anything that is, that would qualify as, you know, fat shaming or anything critical of people who, uh, who have these conditions. And so as a result, you just sort of, again, you have the, that you have Congress not really doing anything. And then you throw in, the fact that the a, a government agency, the the government accountability office, did a big report about a year ago of all of the different f- the federal government's kind of initiatives around sort of food and health, and it was a stunning indictment. This is an independent office, but a stunning indictment of the fact that there was basically zero coordination within the federal government. I mean, there's not much happening to begin with, but even those programs that do exist, they're not coordinated at all. And again, and so it just, the all of the, it just speaks to how Washington is just really MIA on this, on this issue. And it's not that government is the ultimate solution, but there, I think there is a role for government given this national crisis that we're living, you know, it's sort of been this slow burning crisis. And and now, again, we have the highest obesity rate in the world, and is Washington going to do anything about it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just read, I think it was yesterday, that Prince Charles is looking to hire a vegan chef. Oh. <laughs> so wouldn't that be something if, uh, you know, Biden and some of the, the people, uh, uh, Camilla Harris, you know, they, they got a, a, a vegan chef to come? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, no, that would be. And I should and I should say that the Biden administration, they, they you know, they had a, a kind of a, what's called the White House Conference on Health and Diet, and I can't remember the full name, and it was the first such conference that actually since 1969 when actually Richard Nixon did it. And so they, it was a one day conference, you know, in our world, just the fact that there was a white house conference was kind of held up as this great milestone. And look, I give them credit. It it remains to be seen how significant, um, uh, sort of what the follow through is. And, but, 
it's not, you know, but but President Biden did come and he spoke. And so that's yeah. that's encouraging. But there again, there's a lot there are massive forces working against any change. I think you had like Neil Barnard and you had uh, Dean Ornish and Cory Booker all attend attend that. And yeah, we're speaking and, and espousing kind of the message that we're trying to espouse too. Yeah. And, hey, the answer is really simple. It's just yeah. whole food plant based. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And Cory Booker has. Uh, Democratic senator from New Jersey is, I think he's vegan or plant-based, and he yeah. has football player at Stanford, and he has been a big advocate for the whole um, sort of food as medicine program, and is and is and held a, a a Senate hearing on that, and so there's you know there there are kind of rumblings of reform, and that's uh, that's very encouraging, um, but it's it's small relative to the, 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 the magnitude of the whole problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you look at Eric Adams, right? I mean, yeah, Eric Adams yeah. is really doing, making, making a dent, I yeah, think. Yeah. And, and, I mean, it's encouraging to me to see somebody that's doing his best to drive this, whether it's hospitals, whether it's schools, um, in, into a lot of his policy. And someone who, if I believe, was directly inspired by you and your was, father, it, it correct? Was, it, was, it was my father. Yeah. 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 With his, to help with his um, type 2 diabetes. Yeah. That was, that was really um, taking him down. Yeah. And now he's like, <laughs> if you, I don't know if you've met him anytime soon, but, or anytime lately, but he looks like, um, he's just a pillar. Is he? he yeah. And he's cut and he's like, yeah, he looks great. Uh, let's talk about, so fact number 135 is a strategy for boosting vegetable consumption. Um, so let's see, we're looking here at, this is a, a study that was published by the Journal of American Medical Association in Stanford. Uh, oh, we already talked about this. Yeah, this was the Stanford, so this yeah, is yeah, the carrots with the twisted, citrus dressing and smart choice vitamin C. Citrus carrots and yeah, all the carrots. different ways in which yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that okay, so there you go. Yeah. So basically, make vegetables exciting. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Marketing matters and yeah, yeah, yeah. All the other, all the junk food is getting all this fancy marketing. And so, if there's a way we can we can make yeah, make the fruits and vegetables and whole grains more appealing, you know, all the better. All right, you t we talked about um, health washing. Yeah, but I this one I just had to laugh like the relationship wait not not this one we already talked about that mm -hmm. that was the relationship between time yeah. spent eating and yeah. bmi yeah, yeah we yeah. talked about that but this was a 115 here hershey rolls out a mid-morning snack <laughs> i mean it's like you gotta be kidding me yeah. Yeah. and and here it is right the reese's snack cake yeah i'll point out that I have no connection to the Reese's. <laughs> My name's Matthew Reese. They spell no. it differently, but but um, yeah. Well, and then so at the end here, so okay, so they're releasing this whatever soft baked chocolate cake topped with Reese's peanut butter cream covered in real milk chocolate, and and um, and then the, the you know they almost take this. So the Hershey press release portrayed the company in heroic terms. Now you can indulge in a Reese's treat. Any time of day, consider morning officially saved. And then just the sort of the almost the FU at the end is the hashtag not sorry, as if they're anticipating the criticism. And you know what? That's your problem. And we're it just, again, speaks to sort of the hubris of these companies that they can. You know, it's one thing. Look, they're going to release the product, but they're 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 just they're sort of the preemptive pushback. And uh, so the yeah, and look, this is there's no. I don't think these products have any redeeming health features or 380 calories. And, and again, it's just meant it's something you have in between breakfast and lunch. <laughs> and I can tell you back when I ate these kind of things, my favorite thing in the whole wide world was a Reese's peanut butter cup. Mm. And so if I was still in that frame of mind, yeah. I would see these and I'd be like, oh, I'm all over these. Yeah. I'm going to have at least one mid morning and a mid afternoon. Yeah. So we're talking almost 800 calories right there. Yeah, that yeah. I'm adding to my to my total. That's crazy. Um, One eleven. I don't know if we talked about this. Just the changes in the American eating environment. I feel like we kind of have. Uh, yeah, this is the this. Um, 
resetting yeah, the table. Yeah, sort of the snacking, and yeah, this yeah. is an excerpt from this book by Robert Paulberg, who's at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and and um, and it's just yeah, the products, you know, food products being designed by corporate desi- scientists to be irresistible and relentlessly promoted by food ma- manufacturing companies. And you mentioned the Bliss Point. Michael yeah. Moss, the salt, sugar, and fat book has talked about this, and and we have you know the the science or the research has kind of has been looking now more and more at whether these foods are actually addictive and 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 the way again and this I don't think there's any doubt that they're addictive. Yeah, yeah, and the and and there's been a um, a professor at, at Yale who's explored the way in which some of these foods they. They actually they trick the human body, and the body doesn't even register them as as the calories that they are, and it, that gets into that satiation point. Is, is and, that Cat David Katz? Uh, no, it's no. not David Katz. Her name is uh, her last name is Small, mm-hmm. and she she was written about in this book that that I reviewed by Mark Schatzker, uh, um, the title of which I can't remember right now, but it's a yeah. wonderful wonderful book, and all the but uh, sort of all of these ultra processed foods. They just the human body wasn't designed for these foods, and that's sort of that's the point. And it's and so the they're all, again they're almost tricking the human body, and and so we're eating more and we're not getting full and we're getting unhealthier. Yeah. Um, and we're not and we're not getting any of the nutrients that we need yes. either. Right, right. I mean that's the right. I mean that's, <laughs> you 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 you're eating these foods yeah. and and yeah and, and so you eat those foods and then you don't yeah. need it's kind yeah. of a double whammy. Yeah, you're getting the macros that you yeah. need, but you're not getting anywhere close to all the, the the I mean the vitamins, the minerals, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the fiber, water. Yeah. You know, the list goes on. Um, this is this is something that I was really. Um, I'm not surprised at, but I want to touch upon it because you mentioned something in here that I thought um, was was worthy of bringing it up, and that's yes. the dietary's the doctor's dietary knowledge deficit. Yeah. And this particular quote, who we from David Katz yeah. in the third paragraph. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read yeah, this. Yeah. Actually, why don't you read it? So, yeah. so okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, part of the problem is that medical students receive little training in nutrition, less than 1% of lecture hours at medical schools, according to one study. And the medical school curriculum points out David Katz, a professor or yeah. head of a research center at Yale, is based on a report issued in 1920, a time when, quote, diseases of nutritional deficiency still prevailed and the modern diseases of dietary excesses were inconsequentially rare. And this... I, uh, as I have sort of done this deep dive and I find all of these kind of disturbing facts, the fact that the doctors just are not trained in nutrition and whatever, nutri- whatever training they get, it's often kind of biochemistry. It's nothing about sort of how the food, in- how food interacts with the human body. So you have, you have the, you know, these highly trusted individuals when it comes to health and they're, they just, they don't have the tools to serve the patients who are largely getting sick because of the food they eat. And it just, it speaks to the incredible disconnect um, of, uh, and sort of the contradictions built within the kind of our healthcare and medical system. Yeah. Well, the, in the term here, the last word is anachronis, yeah. anachronism, which is kind of, you know, it's it, it, in the definition is... Well, it's something that that is kind of archaic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and yeah. it's not. It, 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 but it doesn't. Nothing about where we are in 2023, and our kind of the prevailing medical issues lines up with what these doctors are learning in medical school. It is. It is so sad. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's. It's just this real <laughs> void and just a missed opportunity. Um, for doctors, and there have been some schools, or I know there some schools have actually taught to have like cooking electives, and that's great. But you know, but you know, your father was a doctor, and you know, doctors have they spend all this time, uh, you know, in residency, and they often end up with terrible diets and have sleep terrible sleep patterns because they're working so much, and so they're often not they. It's very difficult for them to lead a healthy uh, kind of uh, dietary existence. Yeah. Uh, let's go to fact number 105, the human right. biome fiber and flatulence, because you have a the, the last line here, yeah. David Lustig, a prominent obesity researcher, uh, pithily notes that our choice comes down to fart or fat. Yes. And I think you actually, I think I learned some of this yeah. from you, actually, because you've talked about, I think, walk and talk That's and, right. and some... 
and yeah. and the, the 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 fiber sometimes can contribute to flatulence and 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 bean legumes in particular but we don't want to shy away from that. Yeah, yeah. Look, that's yeah. if that's the byproduct, let's you know, <laughs> we'll we'll take it because it's much better. Yeah. Having a little bit of flat, flatulence is a, is is a yeah. lot better than having yeah. the diseases that come yeah. from not eating those yeah. foods. And and I like to tell people that you know, uh, and when I do have flatulence, my flatulence, it, it they're like raspberries, <laughs> right? It's a beautiful thing. Uh, all right, let's go to. Um, you know what? I don't think we've talked enough about eating out mm. and restaurants. Yes. And I think that's a really, really important one. And you have a whole thing right here, U.S. food spending in yeah. the restaurant yeah. sector. If you could talk about that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, nearly 40% of total U.S. spending related to food went toward restaurants and other establishments. I mean, the, this is, I think, a fundamental part of the problem is that, that Americans are spending more and more of their food dollar out outside the home and the foods that in basically all forms of restaurants but but particularly obviously in fast food it's um in so many ways it's it's you know low in fiber high in fat or high in sugar or lacking the nutrients and uh and look it's 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 it may be somewhat inexpensive but there's a high price to pay for that but the other thing that's changed over the last 30 years or so is that the portions have dramatically expanded and you know we have you been to the olive garden lately i have not but i <laughs> we, we went a week ago oh you did we were at a swim meet in san antonio yeah. and i could not you know we and we got the cleanest we could get yeah i could not believe the size of these these bowls oh yeah i should say troughs yeah 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 no and and look for the restaurants there's very little extra cost for them to serve to basically double the size of the portion so the so the customer feels like oh i'm getting a good deal and so you you overeat and um and you you know the unlimited uh refills on yeah. the beverages again it's probably costing them pennies to to do that and uh the the friedman school of nutrition at tufts did this study where they they did this comprehensive survey of of uh, meals at, in restaurants, and I don't know I think they may have looked at, if not hundreds, maybe even thousands, and the the percentage that met the sort of a definition of kind of ideal nutrition was zero point one percent, and I think it was actually your father who once uh, said to me that uh, you know anytime you go out you just have to know it's the wild west out there yeah. and you don't really know what you're getting and unless you are really vigilant about uh, what you're ordering and how you're talking to the server, you can, they can, it might be presented as, I mean, I've had this experience. I'm sure you have, you think you're getting something vegan and the, the, I don't know, there's dairy all over it or cheese. And, and so um, I, I frankly just try to eat out as little as possible. I mean, that's the, and just eat at home. That's the, and, and, but if you're going to be eating out, you, um, you just really need to take a lot of preventive measures. Look at the menu in advance. I think you've suggested just ask. You know, can the yeah. can the chef just get? Uh, don't even order something on the menu. Just say, can I just get some steamed vegetables and and maybe some grains? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I'll just give a little plug here. If anybody is in Austin, Texas, or comes to Austin, Texas, a really fantastic place where you can eat super clean, whole food, mm. plant based, no added oils is Casa de Luz, mm. which stands for House of Light. Oh, okay. Which I've been going to since like 1989. Spectacular place. Yeah, that's. You need to go if you. I, been. I maybe I'll go this afternoon. <laughs> you, you should. Um, let's talk about because everybody asked me this question, yeah. and I'd love to know because you did some research on it. And it's a uh, fun fact, or I shouldn't say fact, fun fact, it's fact number 78, and that is organic yeah, versus yeah. verse, uh, non-organic food. Yeah. And, and the results that you came up with it here in your research actually yeah. surprised me. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, this is, there are reasons, there, people can come up with many different reasons to eat organic food, and, and um, it, may have a, it may have a lower... Um, obviously, they're not using pesticides, and there are a vari variety of other factors. Uh, but you know, the, the, there's not compelling evidence that organic food is actually healthier than non-organic food. And the USDA has been, you know, the U United States Department of Agriculture it made that very clear when they created the the designation. And so, it's I think that that 
and you know organic food it tends to be more expensive and yeah. and so there's um there you know there are strong feelings about this but but it's i think that um the jury is kind of out as to really whether for if for for purely health reasons whether it's it's a clear advantage to eat organic food yeah. and that and the, again they're a very comprehensive study from stanford university has uh has pointed that out yeah. as well yeah which i think is for many people that are out there it should be very comforting yeah Right. Yeah, and just and, just do your best to get more fruits, more right, vegetables, right. more servings of all yeah. of these whole plant-based foods. Well, and there's one. I mean, there's one interesting study as well showed that when people were eating organic food, they thought they were under the impression that because it's healthier, so I don't actually have to exercise as right, much. Right. And so, and then you have the issues around again the cost and is it is it potentially leading people to just not buy right. uh, or you know any fruits or vegetables if the only option is organic. Yeah. Well, and then you've got organic donuts, you've got well, organic sugar, you've yes. got organic cigarettes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. When I in that health washing column, I wrote yeah. about this you know this organic ice cream and it was just larded with. Sugar, salt, fat, and I mean the ingredient list had like six different forms of sugar, and and so um, you'll again you will have entities, and we're familiar with them that that portray themselves as some kind of holier than thou. They have this health halo just because yeah. they're organic, and the reality is there is nothing healthy about this food. But they just because they have the organic label, yeah. Yeah. people think oh it must be okay for for yeah. me to eat this. I think it's the same way with gluten free. Yeah, right. Yeah, you got your gluten free donuts, you got your gluten free candy bars, your gluten free you know chips. Yeah, uh, all that stuff. Um, Along the same vein, if you could speak to fresh versus frozen. Oh yeah. And in this, this I kind of, you know, I, I knew this. Yeah. But I think it's a nice something for people to hear. Yeah. Th so this was a study from yeah the University of California Davis, a very eminent uh, yeah. kind of agricultural uh, school, agriculture focused school, and they found you know no significant difference. Um, in the basically the health profile of frozen a variety of a variety of different frozen fruits and vegetables and uh, this was a kind of a wake up call for me. I I never liked that you know after a couple of days blueberries would sort of you know get soft and sort of wilted and so all of the blueberries I buy now are frozen and you can keep them as long as they stay frozen and so it's uh, and. Um, and so it's really it, it's it, it it for the people again like me or others who have concerns about the, the you know am I going to be able to eat all of this quickly enough just just get the frozen option keep it in the refrigerator yeah. and and eat it when you can. Yeah, I tell people if you could see my my freezer at home and between green leafies, uh, peas, corn, mangoes. Yeah blueberries i usually have three different types of blueberries in there we have these big honking ones we got wild blueberries um yeah so i love that you did that with with the frozen versus fresh i'll just put in a plug for uh, one of your videos of the you know i think it was kind of what you eat in a day and it was yeah. you made these these it was both breakfast lunch and dinner and i remember one of them uh in, involved mangoes and that's just uh, for anyone who's looking for just kind of a little 10 minute tutorial that actually had a big influence on me and and hopefully uh, right. others as well nice nice uh rising u.s dairy consumption yeah. this is fact number 52 i i am i am kind of a little bit perplexed that in 2023 people are still Continuing to eat more dairy, yeah. I'm just I'm but but surpri not surprisingly, milk has gone down. Yeah, yeah, that was that was I mean that's encouraging and <laughs> and and but it's but it's offset by all the other stuff um, and all the different ways in which and you know so much I think you know look Americans eat a lot of pizza <laughs> and you can you know I will say you can get pizza without cheese but and you obviously yeah. sell pizza crusts and uh, but. Um, but that that cheese that you're getting on the pizza it has to be has to just continuing to, to drive up the, the consumption levels. Yeah, and, and here you say that you know the the per per uh, capita consumption of dairy in the yeah. U.S. has increased from 539 pounds in 1975 to 653 in 2019. I would have thought it would have been a lot more than that. Uh, yeah, it sounds like I don't know. It's I mean that's you know that's. Um, 
well, because one point seven pounds per day of, um, uh, but yeah, it's whatever you measure it, it's it's a lot and it's too much and it's clearly contributing yeah, yeah. to. And, and I know you're not eating any right. dairy right now, probably. Right. I'm not no, eating any, no. so that means somebody's <laughs> yeah. doubling down, right? <laughs> <laughs> somebody's doing a, a thousand. Uh, yeah. You know, twelve hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's that. It's that Hershey's mid morning <laughs> snack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's all of those products. Um, so let let's. So one of the things that I think is <laughs> going up, and it doesn't really surprise me, is the rise in the U.S. poultry consumption. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you just read that? So yeah, this was uh, yeah annual per capita poultry consumption in the U- United States increased from twenty six point four pounds in nineteen seventy to sixty two point four pounds in twenty nineteen, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I don't, you know, that the, I mean, the I don't necessarily have an explanation other than. You know, people may be having some awareness. Well, chicken's better than beef, and so I'll just get chicken, and that's and then I'm, that's fine, and, and yeah. that's healthy, and and so I don't know. Do you have do you have a theory? As I mean, obviously, no, I do absolutely. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's it started with basically paleo. Yeah. Then it was keto. Yeah. Most recently, it's been carnivore. And did you hear about the new, like all. All meat diet that's out there is called the lion diet, right? You want to eat like a lion. It's just meat, salt, and water. Those three things. And <laughs> anyway, it's just, you know, you, I don't know what's going to one-up the lion diet. Yeah, yeah, right. But yeah, so I think this is why. And people, as we've talked about for the last hour so far, people, they're overweight. They're desperate. They're trying to figure out you know uh, this this riddle yeah it's really not a riddle but it is if you don't if you can't see what we can see you can't see the bullseye yeah and um so yeah they're they're thinking oh well let me just double down on you know chicken or whatever chicken nuggets and yeah and obviously the poultry industry in this country is so huge and 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 yeah and the products are relatively affordable and but without the health benefits uh, I found this. This is fact number thirty-nine. Yeah. America's spending on food as a share of disposable income. Um, will you just re- relay this? Yeah, to people? yeah. So it, it it basically from nineteen sixty to twenty nineteen, the yeah the share of disposable income spent on food fell basically in half from seventeen percent to nine and a half percent. And you know, in some ways, that you could say, well, that's that's a good thing, and we're we're um, we don't have to spend as so we can use our income on other things or have more disposable income. But but what it what it really speaks to is that is the proliferation of this low cost, um, you know, low uh, low in nutrition, um, high in salt, sugar, and fat food, and that's being produced to um, again to sort of su- serve the consumers who are. Who are maybe looking for these these low cost, uh, highly convenient options, but there's a there's a price to pay. There's a I mean there's a there short term, near term, short term, medium term, and long term price for buying such uh, low price foods. And this I mean this does get into this issue that I know you've talked about in terms of does it have to be expensive to eat healthy right. and to eat plant based? And you know you can buy a can of garbanzo beans at Whole Foods for, I don't know, $1.19, and, and you can be, eat even less if you're, if you're buying the, the, the beans by the sack. And so there, and you can, you'll find studies on, on showing uh, conflicting data, but um, it does not have to, you don't have to shop at Whole Foods or other grocers in order to eat healthy. And, yeah. and but you do need to think about sort of the the products you're buying and ideally eating buying products that are in as close to their natural form as possible and and the thing to me that's really surprising is i've i've seen some figures that like 50 years ago 60 years ago it was like 40 percent of our disposable income was going to for food yeah and the fact that it's just basically 10 percent is quite surprising to me 10 percent and and yet we are um, we're continuing to buy the most unhealthy foods on the planet, right? With that ten percent, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not it. You know, it, what 
at what point is getting a deal you know, yeah. worthwhile because it's again these and it's you know and you you if you have the, yeah. the slope going down on on the less lower spending less on food and you the, the, just as the slope is going up on we're becoming more obese there's clearly a connection between the two uh I also, you know how my stance on added oils. Yeah. I'm not a fan of added oils. Yeah, yeah. This fact, number 38, Americans increase consumption of added fats and oils. Can you share yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, this was, this was striking. Again, USDA data, the, the biggest change in the American diet from 1970 to 2010 was increased consumption of added fats and oils, such as olive oil and, and canola oil, rising from 337 calories per day to 562. That's, I mean, that 562 is effectively 25% of what should be yeah. most, most people's calories. Yeah. And, and for those of, the, of you that are not aware, oil is 100% fat and really has no nutritional integrity to speak yeah. of. It's the, it is the... And, and highly, right, caloric, right? Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. you don't have to have much to, yeah. You no, know, right. And so it is, we, we like to say, it, it, oil is to the fat world what sugar is to the carbohydrate mm. world. Yeah. Just empty calories. Yeah, yeah. Right? And here you... And, and you, lots of them. And you only have, you know, 210 calories coming from fruits and vegetables. So that, this it, right here, it, like if you were going to choose sort of one point to kind of try to explain some of what has gone wrong in the American diet, like this, this image in fact, 38 oh. is, um, uh, <laughs> yes. captures it. Yeah. Carrie will have to edit this. So I'm trying to find here where we are. We're going to Wisconsin. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. 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 Can you tell yeah. me what time that was on your audio rip? Yeah. Yeah. One, one ish okay. Yeah. All right. So. All right, um, we're getting there. Yeah. We're getting there. Um, again, I mean, I want to go through every one of these, but obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're not going to. Sure, sure. Um, but we're getting near the end here. But can you speak to this one? A Bolivian tribe yeah. with the world's healthiest hearts. Fact number 35. Yeah. Uh, I found this to be fascinating. I had never heard of the two... Uh, yeah, I don't even, I don't, yeah, I don't even know how it's uh, pronounced. I but. need to... When I see Dan Butner in three yeah. weeks, I oh, need yeah. to ask him yeah. if he's done any research yeah. on these guys and why they're not part of his blue zone. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is you know, research published in a very eminent journal, the the Lancet in the in the UK, and it showed that this um, this tribe had had incredibly low levels of coronary atherosclerosis and and no evidence of uh, yeah no evidence of the condition. Lowest levels were of coronary artery disease of any population recorded to date. The tribe members take on average 17,000 steps per day, derive 72% of their calories from unprocessed carbohydrates, 14% from fat, 14% from protein. Kind of a, you know, how people clear, I mean, this, they're eating like people ate probably hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and they have not been subjected to all of the ultra processed food. You know, I mean, Peter Attila probably would like that 70,000 steps. Yes. But I really like the 72% yes. of their daily calories from unprocessed carbohydrates. Yeah, yeah. Plantains, Plantain, corn, and, and nuts, nuts, right? 14% yeah, yeah. fat, 40% protein. It just looks, that, that's idyllic there. That's yes. a sweet looking uh, diet right there. Um, all right, let's see. I have, well, you, we have talked a lot today about ultra-processed food yeah. and how, how bad it is. But this, fact number 32, basically you let us know exactly what percentage of our calories are coming from ultra-processed food. And what is it? Yeah, yeah, 58%, 57.9%. Um, and, and, and with children, which was in a different fact, it's 67%. And so... And this is, you know, look, it hasn't always been this way. And this, but this, this is the story also of the evolution and the d deterioration of the American diet. And, um, you know, the, this article, this paper published in the British Medical Journal BMJ had a great d description or definition of ultra processed foods, industrial formulations, which include substances not used in culinary preparations, in particular, additives used to imitate sensorial qualities of minimally processed foods and their culinary preparations. And if you're watching, you can see the image of, uh, you know, the, the, the pizza, the Italiano takeaway pizza and the, the, some sort of cookies and the chicken dippers made by bird's eye. And, and, um, 
just sort of these these concoctions that are not that are not natural. Well, the thing that jumps out to me when yeah. I look at this is like whole natural food yeah. has one ingredient. Yeah, right. Just a tomato. one ingredient. Yeah, right. Then we have processed. You know, you got the tomato um, sauce that's got eleven ingredients. You yeah. got the raspberry jam that's got six, and then you yeah. got this chicken roast that's got ten. Yeah. But ultra processed. Yeah. 26 ingredients on the top, then 25 for the basically the raspberries, yeah. and then 16 on this these chicken dippers. Yeah. And the fact that we, if we go back to where we started this, the fact that 58 percent of Americans' calories are coming not from processed, yeah. ultra processed. Yeah. Yeah. That is alarming. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's probably there's no reason to believe that the numbers are, are improving. I think I'm sure, no. I'm sure the numbers are just, are just getting worse. And we see that, uh, we see the manifestation of that in the data on, on obesity and other, other indicators. Yep. I'd like for you to talk for a second about this fact, number 28, which yeah. is the role of physical activity and weight loss and weight gain. This does not surprise me, but I know a lot of people think yeah. that the key yeah. to losing weight and getting healthy is to eat less and to exercise more. Yeah, and yeah. so this actually addresses that, and I think a beautiful way. Yeah, I mean, there's this phrase. I don't know if it's in here, but you know, you can't, um, you know, you can't outrun a, a, an unhealthy diet, or you can't, and and or you can't exercise your way out of an un- unhealthy diet. And I, so much of the evidence shows that look, exercise has huge benefits, and and you and I both know that. Um, but weight loss should not be viewed as one of them. It's, it's, you should not be exercising because for the sole purpose of losing weight. If yeah. you want to lose weight and become healthier, uh, uh, the, real, the real key is eat a better diet. And so, um, and yeah, this, this, this shows, right, the, the exercise to you know, lower bread, blood pressure, reduced risk of heart, heart, and heart attack and stroke. And lo- we all have heard of the people who say, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm running and I'm doing all these different exercises and I just can't lose weight. And you, we remember, you know, the biggest loser, that television show. And what was so um, troubling about that was that, that, I don't know, it seemed like 90% of the time it just showed them exercising. And they just, and I, I don't even remember what they were eating. I think maybe they were sponsored by Subway. But, and look, they were, they were losing a lot of weight. But exercising for whatever, three, four, five, six hours a day, for most people, other than elite athletes that's just not sustainable you're just not going to be able to do that maybe in a reality tv show setting you can and the study showed that people uh many of the the participants in that show regained the weight because they couldn't they didn't i they probably were not getting the focus on food that they needed and they just couldn't sustain the extra that level of exercise yeah no there's been some extensive i think uh, articles written on what's happened to a lot of these biggest losers yeah you know I think it's like 90% of them have come back to weighing what they were, if not more. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, again, <clears throat> um, you got to do it the right way. Yeah. Right? The smart yeah. way. Yeah. Whole, whole food plant-based. Yes, yes. Um, all right, let's just, just to, like a handful more, if yeah, you don't mind, yeah. if, you're, yeah. if you're there. Absolutely. So um, um, let's hit this one, since we're, you know, we've talked so much about weight gain and oh, obesity. Yeah. So... The foods most associated with weight loss and weight gain, yeah. and uh, I think yeah, this is it right here. Um, so, yeah, so it says here that yogurt, nuts, and fruits, yeah. the greatest weight loss, yeah, and then the greatest weight gain, French fries, right. no surprise, yeah, yeah. potato chips, yeah. and then sugar sweetened beverages, yeah, yeah, and the sugar sweetened beverages. In particular, for children, there's very troubling data on just how much uh, you know the average American child consumes in terms of uh, um, Coke and Seven Up and Sprite and the rest. And so these, and again, the, these, you know, one thing that these three French fries, potato chips, sugar sweetened beverages have in common is they're not they're not great in terms of satiation. So you eat them yeah, and yeah. you're still kind of still hungry or thirsty or whatever. And and um, and nuts, by contrast, um, 
tend to be high in satiation, walnuts obviously being the, the, the best to eat, and then, and then fruits. And I, I've also seen just on the satiation point that the, there's been some, there was one study in particular that talked about actually, I think it was sweet potatoes actually have the highest. Oh, we're going there. We're, we're going okay, there. Okay, we're good, going, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's an important one. Yeah. And the sugar sweetened beverages, you know, one of our pillars that I wrote about in uh, the Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue diet was basically pillar number three it was is why we want to make sure we're chewing Mm. our calories Mm. and not drinking them because when you drink them your brain and your stomach don't register those calories as calories yeah and there's really no satiation whatsoever and so you will invariably consume the same amount of um, solid calories on top of the liquid calories so it's just (laughs) it's 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 sad how many people are drinking this instead of water. Well, and also, and, and to your point, it's also the issue. People think, oh, well, I'll just have a Diet Coke or a Diet, and that's not the answer. <laughs> Tea and water, right? I mean, those are those are sort of our, our best beverages. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. We, we talked about the satiating foods here. Let's go right there and talk about it. That's, it's number nine. Mm-hmm. All right. And here we go here. The most and least satiating foods. I'm going to let you take it away. Yeah. So this, this is, I think this is very important because look, hunger and satiation do factor in so much to, to, you know, why people eat. We want to, we want to be filled up. And so, um, so we have, yeah, boiled potatoes have a, I mean, they have a 323% kind of satiation factor at the, at, at one end. And at the other end, a croissant came in, showed worst, and then a cake, donuts, Mars bar. Um, so, and again, you're, so you're getting these foods that are typically don't, are very low in nutrients, very high in calories, and they don't fill you up at all. So you're just going to be eating more. And I think it was good to see that, you know, oatmeal scored, uh, scored very well. Well, um, oatmeal was number three. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it says ling fish. Yeah, well, I, I don't even I don't know even, what a ling yeah, fish I is. I don't know <laughs> that either. But, but, you know, oranges are fourth. Apples are fifth. Brown pasta. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, baked beans yep. score high. So, so uh, really the top, the top five, except for the ling fish, are all... Some sort of a, a whole food plant based yeah, source. Yeah, yeah, and um, <clears throat> and I think fit, fun, you know for each individual maybe it's going to be a little bit different, but finding those foods that you like that fill you up and that are that have those nutrients or, that are good for you is where you want to the focus should be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got two more. Yeah, two more. Hey, we got to talk about protein consumption in the United yeah. States. That was fact number seven, and. Um, I'll let you take it away, and then I'll make a comment or two. Yeah, I mean the the recommended daily allowance is zero point eight grams per kilogram. You know, fifty six grams per men, forty six grams for women. The most recent USDA survey shows dramatically more. Uh, you know, ninety seven that the average American male is having ninety seven grams, women sixty nine grams, and you see this. I mean, this comes back a little bit to the health washing. You see so many products touting you know high in protein. And there's this sense, and I've learned this, you know, from you and from others that that somehow we're we always need more protein and that we're protein deficient. And the reality is that Americans get too much protein or much more than they need and not enough. And they don't get the fiber that they need. And no one rarely do you see you don't you see much, many more products touting their protein than their fiber content. And and you know the the hamburgers don't have any fiber and they may be high in protein. And so the 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 focus and somehow the I don't know the protein people out there have done a great job of convincing Americans that we all need more protein when that's just not the case. Well, I would even go as, as far as to say that I would bet you the vast majority of Americans are protein toxic. Mm. And as it says there, 64% of the total protein yeah. intake is coming from animal sources, which is deleterious to our health yeah. and does a real number. Um, and I won't go into all those things right now. So just suffice it to say, everybody, that when you're eating a whole food, plant-based diet, like the one that we prescribe, recommend, you're getting all the protein you need, you're getting complete protein sources, and it's really the Goldilocks version uh, with all nine of the essential amino acids. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And let's, let's end on this one, which is where we really started, mm-hmm. and that's a big fat crisis. Yeah. 
right? This was do you, so when you posted this mm -hmm. back on October twenty sixth, yeah. two thousand and twenty. Did you did you think that you'd still be doing this two plus years later? Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. And I didn't. I kind of started this, and I didn't really know where this was going to go and where it was going to evolve and how it would be received. And I just knew that if nothing else, if it was just an intellectual outlet for me and forced me to kind of document some of these uh, troubling indicators, that was sufficient. And if other people found it interesting, you know, all all the better. But this, to me kind of just spoke to the just how far the United States had fallen and that not just the the increase in the obesity rate but you know the largest absolute increase of any country in the world except for a few small south south pacific island nations and it just again shows how much we've just sort of veered off the course of 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 health and 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 the way in which food is is driving these high rates of of disease disability and death and just, you know, and then the, again, the fact that the, you know, U.S. life expectancy, even pre-COVID was in decline, but even before that was the lowest of developed countries in the world. And, yeah. you know, let's keep in mind, we have the low, we have the worst sort of health outcomes and we spend at least about twice as much on, on health on a per capita basis as all of these other countries. So we're getting the worst of both worlds. And why is this, so, you know, <laughs> how is this acceptable? Yeah, right. How is it acceptable? And why? And and the whole kind of healthcare debate is, it's it's there are so many different factors that play into it. But fundamentally, when we talk about uh, kind of discussions about healthcare policy in this country, what I at some point it was about five or six years ago, I realized, wait a minute, how comes no one no one's actually talking about getting people healthier. It's like it's it's as if it's just not even part of the debate. We're going to we're going to rework kind of how insurance works and 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 Medicare coverage and so all these different things, but there's no emphasis or so such a small little emphasis on actually just improving the health of the American people. And that's that's ultimately what that's where the focus should be and needs to be and it really isn't. Yeah. Yeah. What uh take that out here um so how can i subscribe to your newsletter if yeah. i want to you know get this does it come out once a week it comes out it, it's uh yeah. it's sort of a I, I the goal would was for it to come out once a week it comes out at the moment it comes out about every other week and uh -huh. it's, it's i write kind of more of a of an essay i've been doing some longer pieces they, they started out much shorter but it's the so the website is just foodandhealthfacts.com and there's a there are a couple of different uh, places where you can just click to subscribe and it's free. And uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, food at uh, food health facts. And um, there obviously sh kind of shorter items highlighting some of the uh, some of the troubling developments that we see almost every day in the world of um, mm -hmm. kind of food, food companies and what they're peddling. And um, I welcome any and all subscribers and, and feedback as well on what I'm writing. Are you subsidized by Big Broccoli or, or Hershey's? <laughs> no, uh, no subsidies at all, yeah. and just a just a kind of a labor of love. And and uh, I wish I had some better news to report on a re more regular basis. And I do look for positive uh, uh, developments. But um, as I said earlier, I don't uh, I don't see the I don't see any any upside in painting a rosier picture of kind of American's health than, than, mm -hmm. than, than, than the reality, which is so, so depressing. Yeah. You know, I, I've said this on the podcast many times, but I do feel like we will get there just like we kind of did with smoking, yeah. right? You mentioned yeah. it was mm -hmm. smoking, how, what, it was 42%, 42%. and now it's down below 20%, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. Four, about 13%. 13%, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I think it will happen with the way we eat. The only question is, how long will it be? Will yeah. it be? Will it be, fifteen years? Will it be a hundred years? Right. You know, what will be the tipping point? Right. And um, because to me, it is the the silver bullet that will allow us to mitigate the major ills that are going on right now that we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm right there with you, and you've been a big inspiration to me and your father and all of the work that that you have done with the, the whether it's the food you sell or the books you've written 
and the messages that you get out. And so I hope that um, if I can just do my one little part <laughs> to sort of build on all of your great work, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, this has been a fantastic hour and a half, super, you know, um, important look into what's going on with food and health in this country. I can't wait to have you back on and we can talk about a bunch more facts, uh, maybe in you know six months to a year. But I really appreciate you coming on the Plant Strong podcast, Matthew. Thank you, Rip. It's great to, great to be here. It's really been an honor. Keep it Plant Strong. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Matthew's website, once again, is foodandhealthfacts.com. And I would encourage you to pay a visit and also sign up for his website to stay on top of all of the research and entries that Matthew posts about. And a little FYI, it's also a wonderful source of information for people who are just curious and interested on the impacts of nutrition on our overall health. It's not always pretty, but it is the truth. And the best way to combat these forces is through knowledge. Thanks, as always, for listening to the Plan Strong podcast. And always keep it plan strong. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Ann Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.